live from Broadcasting House, from wherever you're watching us in Kenya and around the world. A warm welcome to KBC Prime Edition. Good evening. My name is Tom Boyer. Karen Kibet Manakwet, as she's fondly referred to by our colleagues, is back and she's in charge of sports tonight, of course, later on. Also, the day's business coming up. Remember, Susan Fuku on set, handling the sign language docket. All of that is what we have for you tonight. And this live broadcast begins right now with an executive summary of our lead stories tonight. It's raining in Nairobi, but we want to warmly welcome you to this live broadcast. Our socials at KBC Channel One. And we begin with this lead story, the story of petrol. The price of a liter of super petrol could hit the 300 shillings mark if the Israel-Hamas conflict goes on. Now, this is according to the Energy Cabinet Secretary, Davis Chirchir who appeared before the National Dialogue Committee Monday as it probes the rising cost of living. Churchill told the committee that petroleum product prices could rise to 150 US dollar per liter if that conflict that's taking place in the Gaza Strip continues, adding that the government-to-government -government collaboration could soften the blow at the pump. Here is our reporter, Abdiaziz Hashim, with those details. <laughs> the National Dialogue Committee on Monday held its last consultation with economic experts to discuss the rising cost of living. And this morning, Nadok met with key ministries. It is at this meeting that Energy Cabinet Secretary Davis Churchill revealed external shocks in the oil market could see a further hike of fuel prices, citing the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip. We can do much on the international pricing of petroleum, which has soared from a $70 to $80 to $90. And I read an article in the Financial Times the other day because of the Hamas and uh, Israeli war, that freight, uh, sorry, that the international prices could go up to $150. And that would literally mean our products going to a high of 300 shillings uh, per liter at the pump. We hope it doesn't get there. This, as Treasury Cabinet Secretary Professor Njogo Nandogo told the committee the government is addressing the cost of living by increasing the supply of food to offset the effects of the current economic hardships. There is no way you are going to find people producing food if you cannot sell the food. You cannot sell maize. You cannot sell your rice. You cannot produce. When markets are functioning, then you know that upstream, downstream, you increase production and productivity. Then, when you are there, and Kenyans, we are known for smallholder production. Upstream, you are observing higher incomes. That gate, that, that bridge that we have destroyed, that somebody has captured the market, then it means that you cannot produce food at the appropriate time. Meanwhile, Housing Principal Secretary Charles Hinger continued to defend the affordable housing project as key in creating employment and boosting revenue. This country we import hinges, chair. Hinges we import. Now, I don't know, we can just look at this door here. And if you count, there are about four hinges on each door. On average, a house has five doors. So that means those are 20 hinges you can make from just one house. If you do 200,000 homes, you do the math. How many hinges are we talking about? And as much as hinges looks like a, something we should not be talking about in a national dialogue, hinges could end up being a big industry because you have created the consumptive demand. However, economic experts argued that increased taxation, debt crisis and corruption have worsened the economy. 
The committee is working against time to beat the 30-day deadline that ends on 22nd of this month. The National Dialogue Committee is expected to have its final sitting this coming Thursday as they finalize on their report that they will table before Parliament and further on to President William Ruto as well as the ODM leader Raila Molodinga. Abdiaziz Zizashim from the Bombers of Kenya, Prime Edition. Fuel prices, they are hitting an all-time high. Now, 903,260 Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education Examination candidates began their exams today. The candidates started with Chemistry, Paper 1, that happened in the morning, and English Functional Skills Paper in the afternoon. Basic Education Principal Secretary Dr. Belio Kipsang said that his ministry, in collaboration with other agencies, are well prepared to guarantee the exam's credibility. Dr. Bellio further assured the public of learners' safety across the regions. Monday morning, Westland Sub-County Examinations Container. As a norm, center managers picked exam papers for this year's KCSE. <laughs> it is here that Education Principal Secretary Dr. Bellio Kipsang announced the government's position. We've been able to deal with quite a number of... Uh... Uh, spaces on social media. Quite a number of them have been brought down. Quite a number of them have been closed. Quite a number of people have been arrested. While assuring the public of learner safety across all regions. You that so far so good. There is adequate deployment and the multi-agency team is working very well. Separately, the Teacher Service Commission has assured its commitment in making this year's examination a success. The commission's chief executive officer, Dr. Nancy Masharia, made the remarks in Mombasa County where she oversaw the distribution of today's examinations. Yeah, we work as a multi-agency team. So even in those areas that are, are, are not very, I mean, because of the rains and so on, uh, the government is ready. We have copters ready to airlift uh, these exams uh, and so on. In Kericho County, two girls wrote the chemistry and English literature exams while at Kericho Referral Hospital. I wish to confirm that we have uh, two KCSE candidates uh, who delivered in our hospital. One girl will actually sit all the exams in the hospital because of the condition of the child, while the other one has actually been discharged, so the subsequent exams will be undertaken at the school. <laughs> In the volatile regions of the North Rift, examinations went on smoothly. These coming weeks after bandit attack at Kapindasum and Kisarian areas in Baringo South, Baringo County. Tunaamini kwamba maofisas wetu watafanya BD na jitihada kwa kikisha kwamba mitihani mefika mahali ambapo inatakiwa kufikia. And uh, all uh, system have been put in place, make sure that the exam is done as per the Kenyan National Examination Council regulation. Since the beginning of the exam today, everything has been going very well and running smoothly. We've had no cases whatsoever. The national exam is set to run until November 24th, ending with physics practicals. Pasai Frederick, reporting for Prime, Edition. Thousands of Kenyans are affected by the ongoing heavy rains being witnessed in most parts of the country. 825 households in Tana River have been affected by the floods with the number expected to rise. According to Kenya Red Cross, regional coordinator Hassan Musa, homes in Tana River and Lamu counties which are worst affected in the coast region have been marooned and roads are cut off. Here's that story by Khalid Abdullahi. Many families have been left homeless after their houses were submerged following heavy rains that are pounding different parts of the country. Speaking to KBC on phone, Kenya Red Cross Coast Regional Coordinator Hassan Musa revealed that at least 825 homes have been affected by the ongoing floods in Tana River County. Uh, so far for Tana River, yes. uh, we have 825 people, I mean households affected. And this is mostly in part of Tana North. Uh, area of uh, Umoja, Derry, these are areas that are maroon. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the number may increase uh, uh, depending on the, the flow of uh, water from upstream. Hassan has urged residents to move to higher grounds following the harbor occasioned by flash floods. And now we have actually sent our early warnings that they need now to move to higher grounds because mm. if you look at uh, water level in Arisa, 
bridge there. Mm. It was reading 5.5, today is reading 5.4. Mm. Meaning in the next few days, uh, the people in the lower Tana, I mean that is Tana Delta, they need to move because definitely after 24, 36 hours, they'll, they'll definitely have the same effect. This council's residents of Tana River County, especially those residing along River Tana, have been urged to move to higher grounds. Gaston MP Ali Wario and his Galole counterpart Said Hiribai have warned residents against defying the advisory of the Kenya Meteorological Department. Na omba nyinyi watu wangu. Saa hii msingoje kuathirika zaidi, mwanze kutoka huko juu pande za juu. Kwa sababu hii mvua ni nyingi na itaanza kunyesha nyingi zaidi. Tahakikisha tuzungumza na serikali ili kwa wakati huu ambao kwa ni mgumu tunaweza tumeitisha relief food kwa wale ambao kwa wameitajika kwa sababu wameondoka katika makazi yao wameenda sebu ingine. Several parts of the Tana North including Hola Town were this weekend submerged in water while people were displaced from their homes. <laughs> Elsewhere farmers in Mandera County are grappling with substantial losses after their farms were swept away by floods caused by continuous rainfall in the region. Farmers in Mandera East, particularly in Border Point 1 scheme, are the hardest hit, losing over 35 hectares of farmland. Iko watermelon, Iko kitungu, Iko mahindi, Iko spinach, Iko bilibili, Iko, iko maharawe, Iko vitu mingi. Na karibu, hii shamba, inakaribia karibu mulion moja hasara. Um, all their farms, food is all gone, and they're appealing to our offices. And uh, I would urge the national government to come in handy and support the farmers of Mandela. Well, the November 2023 rainfall review by the Meteorological Department indicates that uh, most parts of the country will experience above average rainfall right across the country. Now let's shift gears and move into the space of politics where the battle for political survival by Meru Governor Kawira Mwangaza shifts to the Senate as she is set to defend herself during the start of the impeachment hearings that kicks off tomorrow. The county assembly is expected to make its case Tuesday before a committee of a whole house to outline its reasons for impeaching her. Wednesday, Kawira's legal team comprising of nine lawyers, nine lawyers will make their case as they seek to insulate her from impeachment by the Senate. JJ Curia with the details of the governor's second, by the way, impeachment within one year in office. The fate of the embattled governor lies in the hands of senators who will from Tuesday listen to her accusers and her defense before a committee of the whole house after members voted last week to have her impeached conversed in plenary. I want to plead with our colleagues, even if you're pursuing a particular interest, don't be unfair on the house. Don't cast aspersions to the house and believe that for whatever reason, members will suddenly not reason that the only way you can concentrate is if you're reduced from being 67 to only 11 of you. It is the responsibility of this house, Mr. Speaker, to find out whether on the facts and the evidence that threshold has been made. The hearings will last for two days, with the county assembly expected to take the better part of Tuesday to prosecute its case against the governor and summon witnesses. And like her previous impeachment in December last year, both teams have retained their lead counsels, Dr. Mudomith Yankolu for the county assembly and Elias Mutuma for the governor. Each side has been allowed nine legal representatives, including the lead counsels. The county assembly has lined up seven witnesses and is seeking leave to call more witnesses to the stand to substantiate the eight charges leveled against her. In what could reveal the scale of split between the governor and the county political leadership, in the witness list is Bohori Member of Parliament, who is also the chair of the Meru Parliamentary Caucus, Mogambi Rindikiri. Governor Mwangaza will also take the stand to defend herself, or her legal counsels are expected to present three other witnesses. All the elected 47 senators will take a vote on each of the eight charges leveled against her. If the plenary upholds any of the charges, Governor Mwangaza will stand impeached and will cease to hold office. If the plenary dismisses the charges, it will have handed her a political lifeline 
booking her slot in the history books as the second governor to survive two impeachments within one year, effectively dealing a blow to the jinx of governors who have been tried in plenary and survived impeachment. John Jacob Curia, Prime Edition. Well, if you log onto our website, that's one story that we have covered extensively. We continue uh, to look at that story, but right now we are taking a short break. And coming up, we deep dive into the second part of Monday's coverage. Stay with us. Tips brought to you by Equity. Masaya Kiba Nisasa. Saving enables you to set aside money towards realizing your financial goals, whether long term or short term goals. The savings also come in handy during difficult financial times. Start saving today. Simply use the Equity mobile app or log on to Equity Online. We've gone ahead to come up your school fees with your other kid. Thank you, God. Sad to sign a lot of moto. Chesa Loto Moto. Shinda Pesa Moto Moto. Welcome back to Prime Edition. Moving on, Deputy President Regade Kashagwa has brokered a deal between Kiambu Governor Kimani Wamatangi and members of the county assembly who have been threatening to impeach him. In an eight-hour meeting held at the deputy president's official residence in Karen Monday, that was also attended by MPs from Kiambu County, Governor Wamatangi said he had no problem allowing the M MCAs to implement development projects. The deputy president listened to the 86 MCAs, the members of the National Assembly drawn from the county, the senator, and the governor separately before convening a joint meeting in which the outcomes were announced. Establishment and management of Ward Development Fund was one of the issues that the MCAs raised. The MCAs had also alleged that they were being sidelined in allocation of bursaries. It was also resolved that a three-day meeting between the MCAs and the governor will be held from the November 23rd, 2023 to thrash out those outstanding issues. and my team in the executive as a governor to ensure that the attitude and the atmosphere that prevails within our relationship with the county assembly is at its best for us to succeed in service delivery. I would want a situation where you and the governor work together when you go to inspect development, when you go to launch development, so that the governor can take credit and you can take credit as well. Yeah? And that situation works out very well when people are united. So that is a piece I'm trying to ask you today to please agree that first we are not here to fight, we are here to look for a solution. From Kiambu we move over to Nakuru where there's a disturbing report. 11 people have died in a grisly road accident in the wee hours of Monday morning in Gata area along the Nakuru Eldoret Highway. The accident occurred after the driver of a lorry rammed into a 14-seater public service vehicle after he lost control of the vehicle. Three of the passengers are currently fighting for their lives at the Nakuru County Referral Hospital. The driver of the lorry registration number KBC753Y is a fugitive of the law after he fled the accident scene. This is the aftermath of the 3.30 a.m. road accident in which eight people died on the spot, among them a six-month-old baby and the driver of the PSV belonging to Farasi Sako Ban for Nairobi from Kitale. From the from the impact where the actually where the accident happened, the the driver the the Lord driver actually moved from his um, 
uh, his lane to the to, to this other lane of the matatu the opposite lane so most likely the the early morning diesel would have been the the cause but we are yet to to ascertain because actually the the driver also disappeared immediately after the accident wale wenye waliaga walikuwa waliletwa hapa kama mmoja ni watatu wao wako kwa mochari yetu lakini kuna wengine walipelekwa kwa mochari ya annex ile wing ya ya county mochari ya county they have no one so in total i can say there are those are 11 uh, cash 11 mortalities the mongol wreckage telling of the magnitude of the accident in which only three of the 14 people on board the psv survived after three others succumbed to their injuries while being rushed to hospital sai tuko na watu watatu wako kwa hospitali wamelazwa mama mmoja na mtoto mmoja na mwanaume mmoja among the survivors is a six-year-old girl who suffered head trauma and is in critical condition. The driver of the lorry, whose registration number is KBC 753Y, is reported to have fled the scene and police are appealing to the public to assist them trace him. Sio picha mzuri kata kwa watoto wetu kuona mili kwa barabara kila asubui na kwa hivyo tunaomba serikali kama kweli wako nia mzuri na sisi Tafadhali, waweze kuangalia hii maneno ya jale ya hii barabara. This comes in the wake of the launch of the National Road Safety Action Plan 2023-2027 by the National Transport and Safety Authority seeking to reduce road fatalities by 50% by the year 2030. Regina Manyera reporting for Prime Edition. Now, President William Ruto has hailed Kenyan security forces for being steadfast in maintaining regional peace something he says has earned the country international accolades addressing the 27th conference of the international associations of peacekeeping training centers held here in nairobi kenya the head of state said that kenya will take up the mantle of spearheading peacekeeping mission in the war ravaged caribbean island of haiti as part of its resolve to having a peaceful world Over 300 delegates have converged in Nairobi for a week-long International Association of Peacekeeping Training Centers conference to deliberate on how best the world can be secure. Addressing the delegates, President William Ruto assured that Kenya will safeguard its role as a leading player in peacekeeping missions in the world. Consequently, Kenya remains a strong regional and global participant in peace support activities. Through our close partnership with the United Nations Security Council and the African Union, we have made significant contribution to regional and international efforts to find lasting peace and stability in our region and beyond. The head of state urging for a united front in curbing conflicts in the world while urging for inclusion of women in peace building initiatives. As a consequence of this multidimensional approach, a sound understanding of the place of women in conflict situations and therefore their indispensable role in defining and driving peace support policies, strategies and programs has evolved. Naturally, this must extend to an expanded role for women in democracy. Defense Cabinet Secretary Ed Nduale, who also addressed the meeting, reaffirming the government's commitment to international peace and security, saying Kenya has refined its strategies through honing the skills of its peacekeepers as a result of continuous participation in such missions. As we continue to contribute troops and resources to peace missions, we are continuously refining our strategies, adapting new technologies and techniques, and honing the skills of our peacekeepers. Indeed, in the face of the evolving peace and stability and security challenges. Reporting for Prime Edition, my name is Joseph Wahungu. Now, the Azimio La Umoja One, Kenya coalition leader Raila Odinga, now says that they will not enter into any bilateral agreement with the Kenya Kwanzaa administration unless it addresses the plight of Kenyans. Speaking in Mombasa, Odinga affirmed the coalition's steadfast commitment to the welfare of Kenyans, stating that they will not relent until the government takes bold steps towards reducing the skyrocketing costs of living in this country. 
azimio la umoja wa Kenya coalition leader Raila Odinga ujeted in Mombasa on Friday held a series of meeting with the azimio allied leaders Monday Odinga joined Mombasa county governor Abdul Swamad Nasir at the Port Rise Hospital in Changamwe constituency in flagging of trucks carrying medicines worth 50 million shillings to local health facilities kitu ambao kwamba tunataka kufanya immediately kuna mashini ya x-ray ambao kwamba tutaweza kufanya sisi wenyewe kama county and we are changing the infrastructure iwe ni ya kisasa pamoja kuwe na ukuta kila sub county katika Mombasa iwe na hospitali ambayo itafanya kazi masai 24 tuweze kupunguza ile pressure pale katika coast center the coalition leader declared that they will not sign any bilateral agreement with the Kenya Kwanza administration unless the agreement addresses the issue of high cost of living which is bedeviling the country sisi kama azimio tumesimama imara na tumesema hatuwezi kwenda kufanya mkataba yoyote ambaye haitaweka ni e, e, mambo ya huduma ya wananchi juu kabisa gharama ya maisha mpaka irudi chini sio alafu yale ingine vile vile ifanyike kukagua mambo kama saba na kadhalika eh si sawa namna hiyo si sawa sawa namna hiyo Odinga lauded governors affiliated to his coalition for their good performance as per the infrastructure latest survey. Hiyo tukio imeni imeni furaisha kabisa. Kimbi ningependa kuambia wazidi kufanya hivyo hivyo. Maana yake tunataka kuona kama watu wetu wanapata huduma sawa sawa. Hata wale wengine wa pande ile nyingine wa uda mimi ningependa kama wao vile vile wangeimarisha hali ya huduma at the same time Odinga disclosed that his ODM party will conduct its internal elections in February next year kama ODM tutafanya uchaguzi mwezi wa February na mwezi huu tutaanza kusajili watu wapya wanachama wa ODM nataka nyinyi nyote muingie ndani ya ODM mtafanya namna hiyo mtafanya namna hiyo kutoka mashinani vijana kina mama yote hapa iwe ni eneo ya ODM Anaita me on the education sector the Kenya Primary School Head Teachers Association Kefsha is appealing to Teachers Service Commission to give them a pay increment despite their employer already handing them a 9.5% pay increment in July this year speaking in Mombasa at as the annual at the annual KEFSA conference uh, kicked off, the association's chair, Johnson and Zioka, claimed teachers were not satisfied with that increment. Our reporter, Jenny Carissa, with more details on the school heads. As is the norm each year, over 10,000 primary school heads converge in Mombasa for their annual five days Kenya Primary School Head Teachers Association conference. Kepsha National Chair Johnson Zioka lauding the strides the government has deployed this year to ensure a smooth transition to the JSC learning as KCP is first out. CBC has taken place and has taken root in primary schools from the grade 1 up to where we are now at uh, grade 7. We are moving towards grade 8 and uh, we are moving seamlessly. In July this year, the Teacher Service Commission awarded the principals a basic salary increment of up to 9.5 increment. However, they are dissatisfied by the figure. So, Zioka lauds the commission for the over 60,000 additional workforce this year alone. However, the association's heads is calling for key emphasis on special learning areas across the country. We have never had such a number being recruited in a single year, as far as I know. So that again is something everybody in this country should be proud of this government. They further called on the government to bridge the infrastructure gap to alleviate the hardship some of the schools are grappling with. We are appealing to the government to plan for that because they are able to. Juni Karisambele from Mombasa County. <laughs>
Hi. Squeeze barabara ni nywe. Kenya Roads Board is committed to ensure an efficient road network for a prosperous nation. Kenya Roads Board, your fuel levy at work. School fees in Totem and Ipua, but in bad with Nata Quendele, throughout. Lotomoto imekuja kwa maisha yetu when I needed it the most. That is all I can say for now. I'm so grateful. May God bless you. Cheza Lotomoto, Shinda Pesa Moto Moto. Back our socials at KBC Channel One. Now, he was the first foreign minister of Kenya and the nation's second vice president. This week on the cabinet, we focus on Joseph Zizarte Murumbi. Joseph Zuzat Murumbi was born in 1911 at Londiani Kericho. Between 1941 and 1951, he worked for the administration of Somalia. Later on, he worked as the assistant secretary for the movement for colonial freedom between 1951 and 1957. Upon the declaration of the state of emergency in 1952 and subsequent arrest and detention of the top leadership of the Kenya Africa Union, Marumbi became the party's acting secretary general. He played a key role in securing legal counsel for the core group of detainees, otherwise known as Kapenguria Six, among them Jomo Kenyatta, who would later become Kenya's founding president. In 1962, Murumbi became the Kano treasurer and in the 1963 elections, he was elected to the House of Representatives for Nairobi South. In the first cabinet in 1963, he was appointed Minister of State in the Prime Minister's Office in charge of foreign affairs. He was instrumental in forming the country's new constitution and was largely responsible for setting up the country's embassies, high commissions and consulates at the time of independence. In 1966, he was appointed Kenya's second vice president following the fallout between President Kenyatta and Vice President Odinga. In 1966, after only seven months in office, he resigned. However, Kenyatta did not want Morumbi to leave government. Morumbi was succeeded by Moy, who went on to succeed Kenyatta upon his death in 1978. After buying his first collector's item at a shop in London in the early 1960s, Murumbi became an avid art collector. By the time he died in 1990, he had collected over 50,000 books and official correspondence. The Kenya National Archives has set up a library of 8,000 rare books published before 1900, which were entrusted to it by Murumbi. Murumbi co-founded the African heritage with his wife Sheila and friend Alan Donovan. It has become Africa's largest Pan-African art gallery. Jackie Wimbiru, The Cabinet.
the cabinet to hospital Kenyan seeking eye care treatment and procedures will now be able to procure the services in public hospitals. This is after Mama Lucy Hospital established the first public eye hospital in the country that will offer surgery, lens replacement and treatment for eye problems. Nairobi Governor Johnson Sokaja said that the critical eye care services will be available and also affordable to the residents of Nairobi. Pauline Nasimio reports. Speaking during the launch of Mama Lucy Eye Hospital, Umoja 2 Annex, Mama Lucy Hospital Chief Executive Officer Martin Wafula said the facility was able to restore sight to over 300 patients within one week. And that's why now we have set up a mini ICU at emergence and accident. Nairobi Governor Johnson Sakaja, who graced the occasion, said the initiative will not only help the residents of Nairobi, but also serve the entire country at large. Yani leo, tunafungua kwa mara ya kwanza, tangu mwenyezi mungu ajenge Kenya, na ajenge East Africa, na aumbe Africa. Hospitali ya kwanza ya uma, ya kutibu shida za macho. Katika area hii, da dunia hii. He added that the county government will facilitate the development of the eye clinic by equipping it with necessary resources. The hospital is fully equipped ili watu wa Nairobi wapate huduma. Tutahakikisha kwamba critical eye health care will be affordable to every person in Nairobi. The health facility has 28 bed capacity to operate in theaters and spectacle factory. Tuko na factory hapa ya kuunda miwani. Ukipatua prescription yako hapa ya miwani, hiyo lens, haitukuliwi pali pengine. Inaundwa hapa hapa umoja tu katika hii center of excellence. It will also serve as a training center for eye care and treatment specialists. Polina Simil for Prime Edition. <laughs> We've gone ahead to come and pay school fees with your other kid. Thank you, God. Sad to say that Lotto Moto. Cheza Lotto Moto. Shinda Pesa Moto Moto. Uh, why would you do something like that? Come on, that cat is my pet. You threw my cat out. I never expected my mom to say that to us. I also thought she was being unfair. My mom doesn't get to dictate if or when I marry you. You know that. Okay? Hey! Have you forgotten where we are right now? You can't hold my hand. I'm not allowed to hold my girlfriend's hand. Hey, that's I'm enough. going up the escalator now. I suggest you go see a doctor and leave me alone. I'm insane because I miss you too much. Shuyan, I was wrong. Well, well, there you are. Welcome back. Um, I remember a little later on, uh, we are delighted to have the lovely Maraquette. She's back on studio. She's been away for a while. So we're so excited here in the studio. So she's going to come a bit later on to give us the day spots. But they say, first things first, Betty keep to the day's business. Tom, thank you. I wonder why you're saying my name like that. <laughs> But it's fine. Yes, my name is Betty Kiptum. Let's get the latest in the world of business. Now, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission could close in January due to funding challenges. SRC Chairperson Lin Mengich told the National Assembly's Committee on Labor that the Salaries and Remuneration Commission is currently in a dire financial predicament, which could see it shutting in January next year. Here is our reporter Trevor Ngendo with the details. The government last month ordered a budget cut of 10% across ministries and state agencies as part of fiscal consolidation plan that seeks to contain the fiscal deficit. 
The Salaries and Remuneration Commission, in a meeting with the National Assembly's Departmental Committee on Labor on Monday, disclosed it is facing financial constraints that could cripple operations at the agency. Even as it was absorbed at 25%, this allocation was within the commission working from home. And that is that was absorbed at 25% at minimal operations of the commission, where the commissioners are no longer able to come to the commission and uh, they work from home. We are going to run into issues where we will not be able to meet statutory engagements, uh, obligations. They say the commission's budget has been progressively reducing over the years. The recent budget cut of 61 million shillings that could affect service delivery come January next year. We are operating on the bare minimum. Now it is being cut to 500. What will happen to us? In fact, it should be increased. We are likely to close the commission on 1st of January 2024. Uh, That's actually the budget cut. It's 40, 50, 60. Meaning, as we have said over and over, it means that the commission from January will, will not be able to operate. Basically, that's what it is. Officials from the Salaries and Remuneration Commission say their work has helped Kenya reduce the wage bill from the previous 51% of Kenya's total revenue to the current 43% and now want the parliament to intervene to have their budgetary allocation reviewed upwards. Trevor Nindo for Prime Edition. And Cooperatives Cabinet Secretary Simon Chalugui has called for concerted efforts in capacity building and forging strategic partnerships to address the pressing challenges facing cooperatives across the nation. Chalugui, who hosted a delegation of cooperative CEOs from United States and United Kingdom, emphasized the importance of enhancing the capabilities of cooperative members and leaders and help in promoting sustainable economic growth. Cooperatives have long been a crucial part of the country's economic landscape, promoting collective ownership and sustainable economic growth. As of June 2020, there were over 25,000 registered cooperatives, representing over 14 million members and mobilizing savings of over 7.8 billion Kenyan shillings. 63% of Kenyans were reported to derive livelihood directly or indirectly from cooperatives. Despite their economic contribution, cooperatives face a range of challenges that threaten their vitality, from limited access to resources to changing market dynamics. Cooperatives Ministry says the government will foster international collaborations to empower cooperatives with the knowledge and skills they need to adapt to changing market conditions. Developments that we have already seen in the past and more that we are rolling. We are happy that the central liquidity facility is now before cabinet and the deposit protection fund, which again will assure our members of the safety of their money and ensure, assure the country that a shilling in a circle is as safe as a shilling in a bank. And again, Minister, bottom up. It works every time. Go to the people, support the people, help the people on their journey, and the people will build the country. Telugui says government will leverage resources and expertise to drive growth and sustainability within the sector. A Kenyan citizen who's not a member of ASACOS, you are missing out. Mm -hmm. So you should find this as an opportunity to join your local ASACOS to support it. It makes for a, grown, for a growing, strong community for strong so and the two things you mentioned that are bef before the cabinet now the deposit guarantee uh, is so important um, everything you're doing to encourage the development of, of SACOs in this country uh, are and the challenges faced by cooperatives include access to financing marketing and distribution governance issues and adapting to a digital age Frederick Mookie for Prime Edition now, more than 4,000 local and international engineers are expected to flock to Mombasa for the annual Institution of Engineers of Kenya Convention. The meeting is expected to take stock of the challenges and opportunities available in the fraternity as a time of great reset. Rhodes Principal Secretary Engineer Joseph Mbugwa says the government recognizes the role of the industry in socio-economic development in Kenya. 
In the last 30 years, the engineering fraternity in Kenya has grown to become one of the most developed in Africa. There are currently more than 10,000 engineers in Kenya, with more serving in other countries around the world. The government says it will utilize engineers in the implementation of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. This is a multi-sectoral approach. Starting with EBK, we have been privileged to be given some funding for the Graduate Engineers Internship Program. This we are only able to absorb about 120 uh, engineers straight from the university. But we are fortunate there are many employers of engineers. Speaking during the launch of the 30th Institution of Engineers of Kenya, IEK International Convention, Rhodes Principal Secretary Engineer Joseph Mbogwa has urged the engineering fraternity to weed out rogue players that are tarnishing the name of the sector. We are ensuring that our professionals are key in implementing some of the agenda. We also have, uh, uh, we also have the food safe security and uh, our engineers in the water sector are working around the clock. During the convention, the World Council of Civil Engineering will also celebrate its 18th General Assembly. For all stakeholders this time, and we want to speak to the Wanjiko, the engineer in this country is available to provide solutions. And this convention, the 30th IK International Convention, is going to provide that platform. Bugwa says the better projects are designed to address current challenges facing the country's economy. When you talk about the affordable housing, you, even if you do very nice houses in one area, you also need accessibility to some of those. You also need uh, uh, quality works to be done in the building sector so that uh, the president's agenda of affordable houses are done. Now, bankers in Kenya have committed to start implementing a shift of financial investments towards nature-positive initiatives and outcomes. This follows the adoption of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures that calls, on <coughs> excuse me, that calls on institutions to disclose the impact of biodiversity and nature-related loss. Equity Group CEO James Mwangi says there is need to solve the integrated impact of nature, climate and people by managing the risks to lives, livelihoods and financial risks to businesses. 62% of the GDP of the sectors that we play on depend on nature. And if then nature is threatened, we have naturally lost 62% of the nature and biodiversity ecosystem is a prerequisite for the survival of our communities and by extension, our businesses. And it calls for large cooperation of businesses and financial institutions to assess, manage, and report on your nature-related risks, dependencies, and impacts. An avocado processing plant is being set up in Malava, Kakamega County to offer a ready market for produce in the area and encourage production of Haas avocados. The processor being set up by CC Village Produce is expected to offer area farmers an avenue to diversify and secure a new income generating option. CC Village Produce, the largest Haas avocado chain in Western Kenya, has set up nurseries in various locations within Malava sub-county in order to enhance accessibility of seedlings. We want to create a sigh of relief in these farmers so that at least there's some hope they can bring here we can get earn some money. So that is exactly our, our vision and mission. Once complete, the processor will be used as a sorting center for avocado received from farmers. The purpose for the episode is to do value addition. That's the purpose, value addition. And we will be going for those foods uh, that may not be meeting the export quality. Not Avocados that do not meet the export standards will then be used at the processing plant to produce different avocado products, including avocado oil, that will be used in other industries such as pharmaceuticals and culinary areas. Those who will not meet the export quality, okay, they will be brought here and will do the value addition and get some other products out of that. Okay? We are going to encourage people of Malaba sub-county and the environs to grow avocado because the returns from avocado are very encouraging. People in to support the crop, Kakamega County government has invested 10 million shillings in avocado promotion 
and supporting farmers' access to clean planting materials. Ndusha Mokami for Prime Edition. And that's the business news this evening. Of course, Marakwet Express is on the other side of the studio already to brief you on what happens in the world of sports today. Now, my name is Betty Kiptum. Do have yourself a good night. Bye-bye. These are the moments we live for every Friday as we catch up with the world of football. Manchester City go in front. With your favorite stars in rivalries like no other that keeps you on the edge of your seat. Learn a few tricks that keep you ahead of the game and spice it all with unforgettable moments on Dunda Dunda. <laughs> On Saturday, you're in for another treat as we rock your weekend with all sporting disciplines. Bringing you insights on what's happening behind the scenes as we share players and athlete stories, preparations and celebrate their achievements. Charging to the line! Is it going to be a world record? Yes, it is! She smashed it! Whatever angle you look at, we've got you covered. KBC Channel 1 your true sports partner. A very good evening to you. I do hope you're holding up well. My name is Karen Kibet. Let's now talk sports. The Sakaja Super Cup tournament enters its fifth round of matches this week at various venues in the city. According to the organizers of the event, the quarterfinals draw will be held later in the week after the conclusion of the fifth round matches. The tournament, which attracted 340 teams from Nairobi's 17 sub-counties, kicked off on first of this month and will end with a grand final on the 16th of next month. Rehe Sub-County FC Lion backed three points after Pangani Youth failed to show up to the Landmower grounds, prompting the match referee to give a walkover. In Embakasi East Sub-County, Zone C, Savannah Border settled to a one draw with Team Unfit. In Zone A, Shaina's All-Stars played out a barren draw with Utawala Youth as did Nairobi Legends and Soweto Hope in their Zone C encounter. In Kasarani Sub-County at the Muhure Moshere grounds, Kasarani Midhill granted Stamford a walkover after failing to turn up for their matches Leventis and Roy Sportive played out to a barren draw at the same venue. In Embakasi North Sub-County matches, Kariobangi FC defeated Dandora in Domitabu by four goals as clever beated Shaina's FC 2-1. Embakasi Central Sub-County Iraqi Foundation defeated Blue Sky 5-1 as Kayole South got a walkover after Matopen United failed to turn up for the match. In Dagoreti South Sub-County, Mseto saw off Udiru Dreamers with a Tony Lewin as Faith Holmes saw off Madara ERC by a solitary goal. Nora Mongi for Prime Edition. The National Volleyball Women's and Men's Provisional Teams, which will participate in the East Africa Community Games next month in Rwanda, have been named. The two teams are expected to begin residential training on Tuesday next week to prepare for the games scheduled to be held between the, the 12th and the 22nd of next month in Kigali, Rwanda. The Kenya Volleyball Federation boss Charles Nyaberi named the squads after the conclusion of the National Heroes Tournament held over the weekend in Nandi County. The women's team includes Masi Moim and Juliana Namutira of KCB Bank, Kenya Prisons duo of Lorraine Chebet and Joy Lusenaka, and Kenya Pipelines Agrippina Kundu, Lois Simiu and Pamela Athiambu. The men's squad has Naftali Chumba and Nicholas Mutui of GSU, Sila Kipruto and Dennis Esokon of Prisons Kenya, KPS Dennis Omolo and Brian Kamundi as well as Eugene Okello and James Mutero of Trailblazers. The two teams are expected to begin residential training on Tuesday next week to prepare for the game scheduled to be held between the 12th and 22nd of next month in Kigali, Rwanda. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
on, DP World, in partnership with the European Golf Tour, has donated over 24,000 golf balls to the Junior Golf Foundation Kenya in a bid to support the development of golf at the grassroots. The donation is part of the DP World Second Life Container Initiative that has been on a journey mission to collect used and unwanted golf balls to give back to grassroots golf and grow the game. Very good. The 24,000 golf balls from DP World are being distributed to 30 golf clubs across the country to help in nurturing talent in Kenyan juniors starting from the age of five years old. Junior Golf Foundation already has 47 coaches countrywide to teach juniors on how to play the sport and has also distributed golf club sets to clubs around the country as training tools for juniors to learn the game. So we are on a great pathway. We are getting the juniors the training that we needed. Two years ago we trained 50 coaches on um, teaching juniors how to play golf. We have seen the results now. They are coming out, they are strong, and they are part of the rest of the world. And as for the 24,000 balls, this is a huge milestone for us. Sports Cabinet Secretary Ababu Namwamba said the donation will help in transforming Kenya into one of the powerhouses of sports in the world. We want golf to be played by everybody. We want golf to be a mass sport. These 24,000 balls are going to go deep into the, into the communities, into clubs, and um, it's just part of ensuring that we have the right equipment, the right environment, and the right conditions to grow, to grow the game of golf all round. So we are delighted. Over the course of the 2022-2023 DP World Tour season, DP World's container has now collected over 230 golf balls, redistributing them and giving them a second life in grassroots golf. Most recently, the container visited Ryder Cup in Rome ahead of its final stop of the 2023 season at the DP World Tour Championships in Dubai. Faith Akini for Prime Edition. Thank you, Faith, for that report. Moving on, Rift Valley Region Safaricom Chapa Dimba Finals will be held this weekend at the ASK Showground in Akuru. Rift Valley's defending champions Laser Hill Academy from Kajedo County, Mwenge FC and Trinity Mission Girls from Nakuru and Ole Melil Girls Secondary from Narok have, been, uh, have advanced to the finals after winning their knockout matches played in Bomet and Nakuru respectively. At the Nakuru's Rift Valley Institute of Science and Technology, Mwenge FC defeated Rolubai FC from Samburu 4 nil to advance to the regional finals. Some of our players are motivated, sana, are motivated, sana kuwa kwa hiyo kukuwa kwa hiyo final sambazo zitafanyika pale na kuru showground. Again, takuwa home ground. That's why tulikuwa na hiyo site tunajua kwa mba takuwa tumibeba watu wengi sana kutoka the mkua uwe tu Rift Valley. Welcome Mungi is remarkable comeback from two goals down in the second half, eventually equalizing the score at 2-2 during regular time led to a penalty shootout that ended 4-3 in favor of Laser Hill Academy who edged out Ololunga FC in an exciting mad derby in the inter-county playoff at Silibuet Grounds. <laughs> In the girls' matches, the newly crowned Nakuru champions Trinity Mission Girls defeated Ridges Queen from Nyandaro 2-1, earning a spot in the inter-county finals as Daisy Mora of Old Melil showcased a superb brace, leading her team to a 2-1 victory over Tembea FC from Kajiado and securing a place in the regional finals. As a coach, I'm going to work about the weakness of the team so that as we are going to approach the regional level, we, we go and fight because at the end of the day, Magasa are ready, are well mentally prepared, physically prepared, and are, are ready to carry back the trophy at home. The four teams will join Uyeta Girls, Itigo Girls, Ndura Sports, and Langa FC, who had qualified earlier, making it eight teams that will be participating in the Rift Regions finals scheduled for next weekend in Nakuru.
And those are all the sports stories we had for you right here, the KBC Prime edition. I'm now joined by my colleague Tom Boyer. Tom, <laughs> it's good seeing you again. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> let me tell you something. Your, 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 that absence, <laughs> you know, made us realize that uh, you missed. Thank Welcome you. back. Yeah, it's good it's, to have you. It's good to be back. Yeah, now, this is how I'm going to welcome you. Okay. I want to give you three questions. The first one uh -huh. um, is this. Sounds a bit more like a quick fire thing. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, so, I'm listening. Would you rather play, be a star in a bad team, or be an average player in an elite team? Be an average player in an elite team. I hope no explanations. Next. Okay. No, well, okay, all right. <laughs> Next. Uh, would you rather pass uh, the ball or score the goal yourself? Score the goal. Yes, Have sir. a goal to my name. But also an assist is, is something. It's something. Yeah. Um, would you rather play but always lose or win but sit on the bench? P play and lose. She don't want to sit on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> fi fi finally, as we wrap up. Because it's teamwork. We lose. It's all of us. But uh, sitting on the, on the bench, it's, yeah. it's you alone. It's yeah, no. yeah. Okay, okay. This one, I'm not sure whether this this one I should ask you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, we call you Maraquet. Okay. Jump high or run fast? Run fast. <laughs> you, get the, the, you get more money. <laughs> Listen, guys, you know what? We'll quick, be back quick tomorrow. Quick as straight to be a millionaire. <laughs> we'll be, I just run. I just take off. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll be back tomorrow at 9. My name is Tom Boya on behalf of the entire team, including Maraquet, who has come back and energized the yes. studio. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs>